Have you ever wondered about the Holy Trinity of God? Well, if you're looking for a podcast with all of the answers about the Trinity that's going to help you understand your faith better, then you've come exactly to the wrong place. But if you're looking for a show that's going to ask questions, it's going to struggle with differing opinions of smart theologians, and it's going to leave you completely clueless, then you found the perfect show for you. This is a show designed to give you more questions than answers. I am Joshua Knoll, and I am just a dummy who loves God and theology and hopes to show my love for God by studying and thinking deeply about topics that people smarter than me have been thinking about for thousands of years. So, there's a ton of different ideas about the Trinity that prevail even to today. But before we get to any of that, I got a little bit of a in-house work we want to try and do here. Um, you might have noticed, missed a few episodes. Uh, I started back at Chipotle, so I have a new job. So it's going to throw not just this show off, a few of the other AMP shows that I'm involved with, like production and stuff like that, recording. You might notice a drop or just a little bit of confusion there. I do apologize. We should be back on a regular schedule relatively soon. Um, also, I'm changing the structure in the episodes a little bit. Um, I've noticed that the last few episodes I've studied, we focused pretty singularly on historical theology or biblical theology. Um, last episode we did with Pastor Will, we were able to get into some practical theology as well. If you recall one of the first episodes we did, we talked about all the different kinds of theology there are. And yeah, we're just kind of touching the surface on a lot of these topics. So I want to do a little bit better. We're still only going to be touching the surface because I'm just a dummy. Um, but if you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice that I have some slides that go with our discussion. It's going to have different paintings that have to do with what we're discussing. Um, I, I believe that these artworks can contribute to our theology. Uh, it's what's known as aesthetic theology, is theology shown through art. So if you're on YouTube, you get that. If not, look up some of these later on. You know, one of the ones I like is still Life with the Bible from Vincent Van Gogh. So that's like our title slide right now. Um, We'll also be focusing on more practical theology. I'll be talking more about my own experience and how that um, speaks to what I believe and how other people's experiences should speak to or help us struggle with what maybe we should believe or think more deeply about. We'll still be focusing on historical and biblical theology. We're also going to be doing more... Um, practical, biblical, historical, um, systematic theology as well, just kind of thinking through logically, what do what are some of the implications of this? You know, what we do at the end of the show, usually where we kind of do the what if. So I'm going to break it down into those four categories, as well as using more aesthetic theology in the YouTube video with these slides. The next two episodes, so, you know, we've, um, we've been going through Genesis and just kind of stopping wherever things notice. Last time we stopped at uh, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and we talked to Pastor Will about the waters, and what is the water represents chaos, and what does that mean if you're a surfer and you've experienced the waters in different ways than other people? So we got that, like, practical theology there with him. I thought it was a great episode. Even though we had some sound issues, I still highly recommend everybody check that one out. But uh, beyond that... There's more to that part of the verse. The spirit hovered over the waters. What spirit? Um, the word is like breath, the breath of God. The spirit of God is hovering over the waters. Is that different from God proper, the father or the son? Who is the spirit? Um, I'm not going to necessarily go into in depth into like exegesis of this verse to say if that spirit meant the Holy Spirit or if it meant God the father or who that meant. But I do want to take time to discuss this idea of the Holy, the Holy Trinity and the Holy Spirit. Um, if you've been in Christianity at all, you know we have this doctrine in most traditions that God is three in one. There's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's three different distinct parts, but there's just God. The worst analogy ever given is like, you know, it's like water, liquid, steam, and ice. Why do I say that's the, the worst thing ever? Because it's all water and there's three in one. No, it's not three in one. That's a bad analogy because... You can't have all three of those at the same time. God is everywhere in all times, so that does that. The analogy just falls apart. Um, it's actually where aesthetic theology can help out a lot. I'm going to see if I can get to this on my slide real quick. I love the the Celtic Trinity knot. If you can look that up um, here on YouTube, I'm showing that we have the slide that's a a um, like a 
a glass dropping and it has the Celtic Trinity knot on there. It's obviously it's the Celtic Catholic Church kind of icon. The reason I like it is because you see the three, the symbol of the three, how they're all one line interwoven. And not just that, there's also a circle through all three so that you have the three are one, but you can tell that there's three different parts. And then that circle representing that perfect unity of the Trinity. That's primarily where I'm going to fall. Um, obviously there are different ideas of the Trinity, but that's the image that really stands out the most to me is this Celtic knot. I'm going to leave that up a little bit while we talk about some other aspects here. So most traditions believe that idea, this, the classic Trinity, there's three in one equal, but same distinct pieces. Um, and most will say that somehow both the spirit and son are subject to the father. The role of the father is to send the spirit and to send the son. And they're both kind of subject to him, even though they're equal, which does seem a little paradoxical. How can you be equal and also subject to it's difficult. And that's where you're going to see the Eastern Orthodox Church and some other traditions believe a little bit differently. They believe that um, they believe that only the Father sends the Son and Spirit. So, going back to like regular, Son and Spirit are both subject to the Father, and then the Spirit's also subject to the Son. So it's almost like a hierarchy. The Orthodox Church says, "Oh, the Son and Spirit are co-equal, subjected to the Father, and also co-equal to the Father." Basically, Father sends Son and Spirit by Himself. If you're Orthodox. Father sends son, father and son send spirit if you're not Orthodox, if you're like Catholic or most Protestants. Um, of course, there are some other traditions, a little bit more fringe usually, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Jehovah Witnesses, some of the others that don't believe in a trinity at all. A lot of people are going to question whether or not those traditions can even be considered Christian exactly for that reason. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little later on, but... um. Yeah, yeah. First, let's let's tackle some other stuff. I'm going to get into some practical theology. Sorry, it does not help. I have a little bit of a cold, some allergies going on here. Um, we, we want to discuss some of these. We're going to discuss some each three at a time. Um, before we get to the practical, let me let me discuss some stuff because some of my practical stuff won't make sense without a little bit of context. Uh, if we're going to see that. God and Jesus together sent the Holy Spirit. That suggests the spirit, the spirit is subject to both the Father and the Son. So that sets up that hierarchy. I know I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but it's but it basically you're stressing the equality of God and Jesus more than you're stressing the equality of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. the The other one that kind of says that only the Father sends the Son and only the Father sends the Spirit that kind of stresses the role of the father as the sender. That is what he does. Um, however, it doesn't really emphasize the equality of the son as much as that other tradition. Um, however, it, it does a little bit better job of stressing the equality of the Holy Spirit. So some some of the way that that see, that's played out practically, when you look at Orthodox versus Catholic churches even, and of course we're going to get to Protestant churches later on, and you have a lot of var variety there. Um, the Catholic Church, you'll see, has a, a much more hierarchical system. I think that stems from some of this theology, not directly, but indirectly, just in their attitude. So you'll see that, you know, you have the Pope, and then you have archbishops, bishops, that kind of stuff. Whereas the Orthodox Church doesn't have a Pope, they, they have like a head of the bishops, but they say that all of the bishops are equal. So they kind of have a, a less of a top-down structure and more of a co-equal structure in the Orthodox Church. And again, I think that indirectly stems from this belief, and we're going to talk about how that split happened when we talk about the filioque clause and that great chasm split that happened between the orthodox and catholic churches um but first i did i want to talk about my own experience because that that's something i've been leaving out a lot on this podcast and i think it's to the the detriment of when we talk about theology even though i am just a dummy i obviously am going to have biases i'm also going to form some of my beliefs off of my experience and the reason that I think that um, I think practical theology is important, same, same reason I believe in the scientific method, right? Um, what you do with scientific method is you come up with a hypothesis. So that's going to be our biblical systematic theology kind of stuff, right? We're going to take the Bible, we're going to take our logic, and we're going to form what we think should be true. Then we're going to test it. We live out what we think is orthodoxy. And if we're if we're leaving correctly to orthodoxy, that's orthopraxy, that is correct practice. And then we're going to experience, 
hopefully if we're if we're living correctly and we're doing it according to correct doctrine and all that we're going to see fruit from that if we do not see fruit from that that suggests that maybe something's wrong if we do see fruit from that as i said that could suggest maybe something's correct you know just like if i have a theory of gravity if i drop a ball it should fall i drop the ball it falls that suggests that there's something to that gravity thing um that's really stupid basic i just don't feel like getting into a lot of science to explain all of that but the the big difference between theology and science in this way though is it has to be repeatable in science to be verified the problem with theology is when you're dealing with god you're dealing with a lot of external factors that you can't really repeat in the same way so that's why I still think it's important we take these systematic biblical theologies, form our hypothesis, and we use historic theology and practical theology to kind of verify with our experience and the experience of tradition to see how does this, what we believe is correct doctrine, play out? And is it playing out in a way that's useful and seems true? If not, let's go back and re-examine our biblical and systematic theology until we get something that's practically effective. So that's where I think orthodoxy and orthopraxy are equally important, which is why all of these different types of theology should also be treated equally important, and I have not been doing that. Okay, so community has always been an important part to the human experience. You know, e even for me, I'm more of an introvert, but, but I can't deny that there is an important truth to community as a human experience. As such, it really makes sense to think of God having created as community, you know, the Holy Trinity creating in community, in love, and that's where everything else comes out. Even if you look at like most human philosophies outside of like any religious philosophy, you'll see a lot of times they'll come up to what gives life meaning and they'll end up equating it to some kind of form of love or charity or something like that because it just logically follows if you look at the path of humanity and the things that psychologically actually trigger us to cause what we attribute as feelings of meaning. So that's where I, I think that's pretty important experience, not just of myself, but of just everyone in general, where we see that. Um, me, myself, I have experienced salvation, right? Like I, I have prayed for forgiveness of my sins. I have felt this transition in my spirit and my soul, and I have felt a change within me where I've gone from a sinner, I've gone from someone who, who my sin, honestly, because I grew up in church, was being overly dogmatic, overly religious, being kind of cruel to other people, judging them in that way. And I felt that change in me. And yes, I still work on it. That's part of why I probably believe salvation as a process, because for me, even though a lot of stuff did change overnight, everything didn't change overnight. There's still a lot of stuff that I'm working on. Some people will say that I was saved, and now I'm going through sanctification. I'll say I'm being saved because... The uh, Greek verbiage there uses this pass and going on kind of a particle to the verb. So it makes more sense to say being saved. Yeah. So um, that's just my belief of salvation from practical things. And I experienced that in the way that I got to that was by believing in Jesus. So my experience was I was saved from Jesus, by Jesus' sacrifice, from myself. Um, and I, I've prayed with the help of the Holy Spirit where I didn't have the words that I needed to say. And I felt the Spirit come on me and speak on my behalf or give me the right thing to say. Or when I'm praying with someone else, I, I've even been praying for someone else and started praying in Spanish. I don't know Spanish. And that person was able to get up and say, how did you know that? I was like, man, I didn't say that. That was the Holy Spirit. And we were able to have this conversation. So I have I've prayed with the Holy Spirit's influence. So of course, I'm going to believe in the Holy Spirit because of that. And I pray to the Father. And, and I feel like there's some meaningful connection when I'm sometimes even when the Spirit is leading me to say what I'm trying to say, but can't find the words for myself. I feel the Spirit giving me the words to say, and I'm still praying to something out there that's not within me. So I think that I felt the Holy Spirit, but I also could tell that I'm praying to God. So that kind of tells me that God was both in me and out, which is, again, that's going to be where I believe in transcendence, but I also believe in like panentheism. And part of how I explain that is the Holy Spirit in us and the Father above, um, you know, above being kind of like metaphorical. I don't think that there's literally heavens above space, anything weird like that, probably like a multidimensional thing. I don't know. 
I felt the pull of the Holy Spirit. And it was different than like your own conscious. You know, your conscious tells you something, and, and you could tell the pull of the Holy Spirit's different. It's saying, pulling you to go to someone to say something, someone to give somebody, you know, money if they needed that kind of thing. And I felt those kind of pulls. I felt those experiences. I've had out of body experiences myself. You know, I went through a car accident, and after I died, I, I kind of saw a vision, and it came to pass in real life afterwards. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. Um, I, I've seen angels myself, you know, in the time of prayer, and I was able to open up. And I saw that, right? Um, I've told somebody before that I felt like if they went down the road, some things were going to happen. Those things did happen. And I could tell it wasn't me saying that to them, right? Um, I've prayed for people and they've been healed of miraculous things. I've gone through an accident you should have died from. Like, I have had too many supernatural or proto-natural experiences for me to say, yeah, there's nothing to this Holy Spirit thing. Like, I, I even as a dummy do have a pretty firm stance that, yeah, the Holy Spirit is real and it's working in me. That is my belief based on my experiences. Um, you know, I know the others, and this is where I really find my own views challenged, even though I have experienced those things. It's so a lot of people I do know who fervently believe in the Holy Spirit, fully believe in Jesus, God, and all that, have prayed prayers and, uh, to me, deserved more of a miracle than I ever deserved, and, and they didn't quite get what they were praying for or they felt let down by God, and that I even led them to not believing in God at all, right? Um, I've even been challenged. <coughs> Why do so many times we see some God, someone miraculously cured of cancer, or, you know, survive a car accident, but you don't so often see stuff very blatant, like a bone broken suddenly going back in place right in front of us? Why don't we see these more visible miracles happening? And I, I think that's a real challenge of experience that we have to think. And that, and, and those... I want us to hold both of those, even though they're intention, like right? they don't make sense together. That's why some people say that the works of the Spirit, we're going to talk about that next time. You know, Mitch, we're going to do this as two parts. This time we're talking about who the Holy Trinity is. Next time we're going to talk about does the work of the Holy Spirit continue? I think that's why a lot of people don't think the works continue, is because they've needed that move and not seen it too often. So I think there's real challenges from experience and real affirmation from experience on the same hand here when we're talking about who the Holy Spirit is and does he work in us today? Well, sure why? It's going to take two episodes. It's going to be a minute to go through a lot of this. So keeping that practical theology, those experiences in the back of our head, we're going to go ahead and go to biblical theology. Going through the canon, what does the Bible imply when it comes to the Holy Spirit? So... When we go through the Old Testament, there does seem to be a lot of different places that suggest there's more than just God, right? We see the angel of the Lord, and we see him equated to God a few different times in Scripture. We see him, Melchizedek, treated as if he is somehow specially of God, or maybe is God. We see different forms of God showing up in, in pretty unique ways. Even past that, you know... um. I have this image here, the baptism of Christ by George Koch. <coughs> and I love this image. I, I love the way the Bible portrays this in a lot of other, there's a lot of paintings of this, of Jesus' baptism, because I think that is the perfect imagery of who the Trinity is, right? God looking down at the Son as he's baptized, which is representing the sacrifice that he's about to make, dying to himself for our salvation. And in that moment, God sends the Spirit in the form of a dove that comes down to the waters where Jesus is being baptized. So you see, <clears throat> so you see all three of parts of the Godhead there at once interacting. Sorry, that cold is uh, allergies really are killing me here. But um, you also see that Jesus prophesies that after him will be a spirit of truth. The spirit of proof will come and that'll be upon you and it'll do all these things greater than even I. He talks about how the church will do greater things. Who is the spirit of truth? How is the church going to do greater things without Jesus there? It's because the Holy Spirit's going to come down. That is who the spirit of truth is and it's going to be working within the church. That is what the power of the church is. The church is supposed to be the body of Christ empowered through the Holy Spirit. Um, Of course, this is a my views of the Bible, you know, other people do have, you know, different things. They'll say, um, looking at the Shema, you know, in Deuteronomy, this is one of the biggest criticism that our um, Jewish and Islamic neighbors have of the Christian faith is that, you know, really, you're polyism. There's three gods. Um, you know, the Shema says the God is one God. 
I am only me is basically what the Shema is. That's a uh, Deuteronomy six, four through something. And that that is, there's a lot of parts of the Bible that says that God is the only God. There is no other gods but I. You know, so so it suggests that there's just one God. And, and the way that Christians have kind of rounded that circle out, because how can there be Jesus as God and then God as God and the Holy Spirit working in the church as the body of Christ? Like, how does all that make sense? We see that the three are one. And that's where we get the Trinity. But the Bible does not lay out that there is a Trinity. There's a lot of suggestions. There's a lot of stuff that I think definitely points to it. But there's a lot of stuff that suggests that God is God. There's just God. I'm obviously leaning towards the Trinity. I believe the Holy Spirit worked through me, through my own experience. But I will not be so arrogant as to say that the Bible does not leave room for arguments that there is just God. But I don't know how you can round that circle and be Christian because... Who was Jesus then? If you're going to say Jesus just was God, then who was he praying to? There's a lot of questions I think that are really hard to answer without at least saying that Jesus and God are God. I think you need the Trinity personally, but there are room. There's room to wrestle within the biblical theological framework. Um, systematically, I, the implications really lead me to just kind of believe. There needs to be a trinity. Historically, we're going to look at some historical theology really quickly. Um, the big thing here is that filioque clause that I mentioned earlier. Um, that's all about the great schism, is what that's called. It's the, the first split of the church. It's in uh, 1054, I believe, where the Orthodox and Catholic Church split over, um, I think it's the Nicene Creed. Yeah, the Nicene Creed. Um, it, it, and it says, originally it just said, that the um, Spirit sent from the Father. And then later on, the Catholic Church added, sent from the Father and Son. Orthodox Church said, hold up. That's not what it was. We've been saying it the other way. And the guy said, yeah, you know, we just added this. It's officially okay to say sent, the Spirit was sent from the Father and the Son, you know? And to a lot of people, this sounds like no big deal. Who cares if the Spirit was sent from the Father or if the Spirit was sent from the Father and Son? Does it really matter? And even today, the Orthodox and Catholic Church allow their members to go to one another church and it count towards Mass, confession, a lot of other stuff that they're able to do. They're able to attend each other's communion. But they still maintain a split over, was the Spirit sent from the Father or was the Spirit sent from the Father and the Son? So, so that split has been an important part of church history and still does play an important part. I mean, even earlier, you know, I talked about the difference of how the Roman and Orthodox churches are structured. Even to this day, that is the structure. You know, the Catholic church is up, down, hierarchical. The Orthodox church is more even. Everybody, you know, even though there's technically a head of the bishops, they're co-equal in the church. Um, so it's a very unique dynamic within the Greek Orthodox church. I definitely... Recommend you checking it out or go to my other podcast, The Whole Church Podcast. We have a few episodes on the Orthodox Church. I think worth a listen to just learn a little bit more if you don't know. Um, also, Athanasius of Alexandria, we have to mention him. He was the first to say that the Spirit and the Holy Spirit were co-equal with the Father. So God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all equal according to Athanasia. Um, St. Augustine, have to mention him. He mentioned that all are equal and eternal. But the Father alone is unoriginate. So he believes that the Son and the Holy Spirit originated from the Father. Only the Father was the first being. A little bit of a unique take. Um, as you go through church history, you'll see a lot of people trying to make sense of this. It is not a doctrine that's easy to make sense of. I don't think our brains can really comprehend the idea of three things in one. Um, it's why, again, I love this knot, the, the Celtic Trinity knot. I think it's just a beautiful icon. Because it represents something that, an art that I can't put to words. I think a lot of our minds can't really comprehend. But the art of this, this simple icon, I really think does great justice. Speaking of the Whole Church Podcast, I'm about to record an episode of our Ecumenical Aesthetics series. And I'm going to be talking about this, not because it's my favorite icon in the church. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, so... Church history, we've had people come up with different theories. We uh, 
for the most part, everyone's agreed that there are one God that is a trinity, three in one. Not a lot of agreement of how that works or what makes sense of it, who is the first being, um, who sent who, but we, we typically do believe in that. Um, I, I want to get to some of those other traditions. We're talking about like the, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and we're talking about like Jehovah Witnesses. Can they be Christian? Um, I'm going to put my answer, and I'm going to give a rebuttal. Um, I heard one person say you should always, every time you criticize the other side, criticize your own side seven times. I don't know if I can quite do that, but I will criticize my own side pretty heavily here. Um, first, I'll say my perspective is, ironically, because I'm, I'm not really a biblical inerrant kind of guy. I'm like inerrant light. But the Bible says to be saved, you need to know Jesus as Savior, confess your sins. That's it. So if they don't believe in the Trinity, but they believe Jesus is God, they believe he's their savior and they confess their sins. I gotta say they're saved. I gotta say that they are Christian, even if I think they're wrong in every other way possible. For me, that checks the box. I have to treat them as my brother and sister in God. Now let me criticize my own stance here of, even though I think I have the Bible on my side, um, if they don't believe in the Trinity, how can they say Jesus is God? It doesn't actually make a lot of sense because Jesus prayed to God. Who was he praying to? Is God just insane? So God was here, he was Jesus, but he just prayed to nothing? That kind of seems dumb. Prayed to his future self, his past self? Doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Um, if you're not going to say there's a trinity, you're going to say Jesus was God, but there isn't a Father, there isn't a Holy Spirit, then who's empowering the church right now? Are you going to say Jesus is still present? In which case did his death and resurrection not mean anything? Where is he physically on the earth? Does he have to be physically here? Did he ever have to be physically here? Because if not, you're kind of verging on Gnosticism, um, which was marked to heresy pretty early on for a lot of reasons we discussed in earlier episodes and we'll discuss again in future episodes. Um, yeah, so we, we have to wrestle with those things. I think they still count as Christians, but I, I definitely see the argument for these being more cult than Christian. I see those arguments. I think there's a lot of weight there. I just can't get there from what I believe the Bible says and what it means. So that's just me. Um, I do want to go ahead and get to some of the implications when we're talking about the Trinity and what all it means. So obviously there's implications for the atonement theory. You know, what are you going to believe about how we're saved? Who Jesus was has a lot to play with that. And who Jesus was has a lot to do with who the Trinity is. You know, um, our, our doctrine of humanity. What does it mean to be? human can the holy spirit dwell in me is god only out there if we're made in god's image are we made as communal beings there's a lot of questions there's our pneumology obviously that's just who the holy spirit is um ecclesiology who is the church if the church is empowered by the holy spirit then its job holds some weight because we are empowered by god himself the character of god was god creating in communion has he always been in communion is that just who god is is partially communion these are important questions of other doctrines some some heavy implications if jesus was not fully god what atonement theories still make sense do any do we have to like do we have to go to like new example like the ones that are only like jesus was a good example that jesus led the way he was the ultimate scapegoat like what atonement series still makes sense if Jesus was not fully God? Um, the Trinity represents our family agendas. Then, like, uh, you know, a lot of people say that God represents, you know, the man of the house and Jesus is like the, the wife of the house and the Holy Spirit is like the kids. And I, I think they get some, some, like, some weird stuff. But what, what implications are there? Of, like, if that's what you believe, what you believe about the Trinity is going to have some different implications of equality and subjection and stuff when it comes to gender roles in your family, right? Um, how does what we believe about the Trinity impact what we believe about spiritual works in the church, right? Like uh, what I believe about the Holy Spirit currently being present has a lot to do with how I believe he's going to be working through the church right now. And if Jesus is Jesus God, that has a lot to do with what I think the church should be worshiping. Um, if God created in communion, does that explain his desire for our unity? The reason he wants the church to be united is because he is united. I mean, that's part of what Jesus' prayer was, that, that they, his followers would be united as him and the Father are united. And if they've always been in communion, 
from eternity, that holds a lot of weight. How do we explain miracles or the lack of miracles? We're talking about pneumology. We're going to talk a lot about that next time we talk about did the works of the Holy Spirit continue. But first, as always, we're going to do three takeaway questions that I think will be helpful for us all. Number one, how does your idea of the Holy Spirit's role impact how you pray? You know, if you if you think that the Holy Spirit is in you and helping you pray to God the Father, how does your idea of the Holy Spirit's role impact you? Or if you think the Holy Spirit isn't here and you're just praying to God on your own, exactly how does that impact the way that you pray? Um, does your view of atonement require you to have any particular view of Jesus's deity? You know, if, if you believe that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice because he was God, that says something. Or does your view of atonement require you to say anything about Jesus' deity? Because, um, you know, some of like just being a good example doesn't really need him to be God. Um, how does the Holy Spirit work through you in your salvation journey today? If you are saved and you believe the Holy Spirit's in his church, that means the Holy Spirit is in you. So you should be asking, how is the Holy Spirit working through you right now? So again, our three takeaway questions. How does your idea of the Holy Spirit's role impact how you pray? Does your view of atonement require you to believe anything about the deity of Jesus? And does the Holy, how does the Holy Spirit work through you and your salvation journey right now, today? Well, guys, I hope you were all just as confused as I am and that you were inspired to study these great theologians and think more deeply on this topic going forward in your own faith journeys. Thank you all for joining this dummy on my journey to learn more about God and to love him better. I hope this has encouraged you all to worship God in your own thinking and to keep on struggling.